In 1966, engineers proposed building the tallest structures in human history using half the steel of a normal skyscraper. Every structural engineer said it was impossible. Every safety expert said it was suicide. They built them anyway. The Empire State Building, that Art Deco masterpiece that defined New York's skyline for decades, used 60,000 tons of steel to reach 102 floors. That's a mountain of metal inside. Massive columns, heavy beams, a forest of steel holding up every floor. That's how skyscrapers were built. That's how they had always been built. Now, look at the Twin Towers. Each tower was 110 floors tall, 8 floors higher than the Empire State Building. But each tower used only 42,000 tons of steel. Combined, both towers used just 84,000 tons of steel. The Empire State Building alone used 60,000 tons. The math doesn't add up. It never did. How do you build the world's tallest buildings with less material than buildings half their size? And how do you take 2.5 million square feet of office space and hold it up with walls thinner than your smartphone? How do you eliminate every single support column from the interior of a 110-story skyscraper? And here's the question that should keep you up awake at night. If this revolutionary design was such a breakthrough, why has no one ever tried it again? The Twin Towers weren't just revolutionary buildings, they were the world's largest structural experiment, built with untested materials using engineering techniques that had never been proven at scale. That experiment cost $900 million and displaced 30,000 people, and almost got shut down by the courts before its first beam was even installed. The story you're about to hear isn't about two buildings, it's about what happens when political ambition meets engineering impossibility. When the laws of physics collide with the laws of power, and when an architect afraid of heights designs the tallest structures on Earth. Because the Twin Towers use half the steel of normal skyscrapers for one simple reason. They weren't normal skyscrapers. They never were. For 70 years, every skyscraper was built the same way. You dig a foundation, you erect a steel skeleton, and you hang floors on that skeleton like ornaments on a Christmas tree. The skeleton does all the work. Massive interior columns, heavy beams, steel everywhere you look. Walk into the Empire State Building and you'll see what I mean. It's a forest of steel columns inside. Every few feet, another column interrupting the space, holding up the floors above. That's how the Chrysler Building was built. That's how every skyscraper in the world was built because that's the only way it could work. The exterior walls, they're just decoration. Curtain walls, engineers call them. They keep the weather out, the people in, but they're not holding up anything. Remove every exterior wall from the Empire State Building and it would still stand. The skeleton does the work. But in 1962, an architect with a fear of heights proposed something that broke every rule of skyscraper construction. Minoru Yamasaki was afraid of tall buildings. He got vertigo just thinking about being so high up. So naturally, he designed the tallest buildings ever built. But his phobia shaped everything about his design. Those narrow windows you see on the Twin Towers, 18 inches wide, Yamasaki thought bigger windows would terrify people at that height. He was designing for his own fears. But Yamasaki's real breakthrough wasn't the windows, it was his radical idea about how to hold up a skyscraper, eliminate the interior columns entirely. The building would hold itself up from the outside. Every structural engineer said it couldn't be done. The math was simple. A 110-story building creates enormous downward pressure. You need massive columns to carry that weight to the foundation. Without interior columns, the exterior walls would have to do all the work but exterior walls are thin. They're not designed to carry loads. Yamasaki's solution was revolutionary. Make the exterior walls thick enough and strong enough to carry the entire building. The walls wouldn't just keep the weather out, they would become the skeleton. He called it the tube in tube design. The exterior walls would form a giant tube that carried all the vertical loads. Inside that tube, a smaller tube around an elevator core would provide additional support. Between the two tubes, nothing but open space. They were essentially building two giant hollow tubes, one inside the other. The engineering establishment was horrified. Leslie Robertson, the structural engineer brought in to make Yamasaki's vision work, later admitted that nobody knew if the design would actually function. 
Computer modeling in the 1960s was primitive, they were flying blind. But the Rockefellers didn't care about engineering concerns. David Rockefeller, chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, had a vision for Lower Manhattan. The area was dying, Wall Street firms were moving to Midtown, something dramatic was needed to revitalize downtown. David convinced his brother, Governor Nelson Rockefeller, that New York needed a World Trade Center. Not just any trade center, the biggest, most impressive trade center in the world. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey became their weapon of choice. As a bi-state agency, the Port Authority had deep pockets and the power to issue bonds without city approval. More importantly, it was controlled by Governor Rockefeller's appointees. Austin Tobin, the Port Authority's director, was a man with grand ambition and unlimited confidence. When presented with Yamasaki's design, Tobin had one demand. The towers had to be the world's biggest, not just the tallest, the biggest by total square footage. Yamasaki's original plan called for 6 million square feet of office space. Tobin secretly expanded it to over 10 million square feet, fearing public backlash if people knew it was doubling the size. The project kept growing because Tobin's ego demanded it. And while political egos were inflating the towers, a very different drama was unfolding just below them. The chosen site in Lower Manhattan wasn't empty land. It was home to a thriving business district known as Radio Row. 13 blocks of electronics stores, suppliers, and small businesses that had operated there since the 1920s. Over 300 businesses stood in the way of the Port Authority's superblock. Between 17 and 30,000 people worked in the area, generating about 300 million in annual revenue. All of it would have to go. Led by Oscar Nadal, who owned the radio shop on Cortland Street, the merchants organized resistance. They held protests, staged mock funerals for Mr. Small Businessman, and fought the Port Authority in court. In 1962, a coalition of 325 businesses filed an injunction challenging the Port Authority's right to seize their property. A New York court initially agreed, ruling that the World Trade Center didn't serve sufficient public purpose to justify the takings. For a brief moment, it looked like small businesses might win. But the Port Authority had unlimited resources and political connections. They appealed immediately. In April 1963, the same court reversed its decision, now ruling that the Trade Center was a valid public project. When the US Supreme Court declined to hear the merchants' appeal that November, Radio Row's fate was sealed. By March 1965, demolition crews began raising Radio Row. An entire neighborhood, a complete business ecosystem, was wiped off the map to clear land for an experiment. But there was a problem with building the world's biggest anything. Cost. The initial estimate was $350 million. That's what they told the public, that's what they told the politicians, and that's what they used to justify the project. But those numbers were deliberately lowballed. Everyone involved knew the real cost would be much higher. As the design evolved and the towers grew taller, the price tag exploded. By 1966, estimates had reached $575 million. Outside observers predicted it would cost $750 million or more. They were still lowballing it. The final cost was $900 million, more than twice the original estimate. But by then, it was too late to stop. The Port Authority had committed to the project. Contracts were signed, and political reputations were on the line. They were going to build Yamasaki's experimental tubes, whether they worked or not. But could steel tubes actually replace steel skeletons? The world was about to find out. They weren't just using less steel, they were using steel that had never been tested. Traditional skyscraper steel was heavy, thick, and massively over-engineered. The Empire State Building's columns were enormous, some as thick as tree trunks. That steel had been proven in building after building for decades, engineers knew exactly how it would behave under stress. But Yamasaki's tube-in-tube -tube design required something different. Lightweight steel that could still carry enormous loads. The exterior walls had to be strong enough to support the entire building, but thin enough to maximize interior space and keep the cost manageable. The solution was a new type of steel specification that pushed the boundaries of material science. The exterior columns would be just 14 inches wide and only an inch thick. For comparison, the Empire State Building's thickest columns were over 3 feet wide. The walls were literally thinner than your smartphone. But here's where it gets really radical. 
But windows weren't just windows, they were structural elements. In traditional skyscrapers, you could remove every window in the building and it would still stand. In the Twin Towers, the windows were part of a load-bearing system. The exterior of each tower was essentially a grid of steel columns connected by steel beams, with windows filling the space between. This grid, all 236 exterior columns working together, carried the weight of the entire building down to the foundation. The windows were holding up the building. The interior space was completely revolutionary. Walk into a traditional skyscraper and you're navigating around columns every few feet. Walk into the Twin Towers and you saw something that had never existed before. 40,000 square feet of completely open space on each floor. No columns anywhere. An entire acre of uninterrupted office space 110 times. But the real engineering challenge wasn't the weight, it was the wind. At 1,350 feet above street level, the Twin Towers faced wind forces that no building in history had ever experienced. The towers were designed to sway up to 12 feet in high winds. 12 feet. Most people don't realize this, but if you walked on the upper floors of the Twin Towers during a storm, you could feel the building moving beneath your feet. The building was designed to move. This wasn't a floor, it was brilliant engineering. A rigid building that height would snap like a twig, a flexible building could bend like the wind and survive. But designing a flexible 110-story building was like designing a controlled fall that never hits the ground. As construction began in 1968, the problems multiplied. Every floor was an engineering experiment. The construction crews had never worked with steel this thin or at heights this extreme. Special cranes had to be designed. New assembly techniques had to be invented. The steel had to be delivered with precision measured in millimeters. Too much variation and the entire tube structure could fail. Each exterior column had to align perfectly with the columns above and below it. Over 110 floors, even tiny errors would compound into catastrophic misalignment. With Radio Row cleared and the political machine in motion, the engineering challenges could finally begin. But every floor would prove that theory and practice are very different things. The experiment was underway, but would the engineering actually hold up when put to the test? Against all odds, the experiment worked. On August 5th, 1970, the first tenant moved into the North Tower. On April 4th, 1973, the ribbon was cut on the South Tower. After seven years of construction, two years of legal battles, and decades of engineering theory, the world's tallest buildings stood complete. The tube-in-tube -tube design had been proven. You could build a 110-story skyscraper using half the steel of conventional construction. The exterior walls could carry the entire load. The windows could be structural elements. Every engineering principle that had been considered impossible was now reality. The Twin Towers had achieved something unprecedented in construction history. They had revolutionized the fundamental principles of how tall buildings could be built. But there was a problem. Nobody wanted to rent them. When the North Tower opened in 1970, New York was sliding into economic crisis. The city was hemorrhaging jobs, tax revenue was plummeting, and the last thing Manhattan needed was 10 million square feet of new office space. The Twin Towers were an economic disaster from day one. For years, the towers stood mostly empty. The Port Authority was forced to become its own largest tenant. New York State moved dozens of agencies into the towers to avoid the embarrassment of empty floors. Government workers filled space that was supposed to house international trade companies. For decades, the Twin Towers were derided as white elephants, magnificent engineering achievements that nobody needed. The towers only achieved 95% occupancy in 2001, nearly three decades after opening. But while the market rejected the buildings, the engineering community embraced the innovations. The tube and tube design became the foundation for every super tall building that followed. The lightweight steel specifications became industry standard. The open floor plan concept revolutionized office design worldwide. Modern skyscrapers from the Willis Tower in Chicago to the Petronas Towers in Malaysia all incorporate principles pioneered in the Twin Towers. The experiment had succeeded so completely that its innovations became invisible. They were absorbed into standard practice. Yet, strangely, no one ever built another Twin Tower. The specific design, ultra-lightweight steel in a pure tube-in-tube -tube configuration, was never replicated. Modern skyscrapers use more steel, not less. Safety margins have increased dramatically. 
Building codes changed after the Twin Towers construction, requiring more redundancy and backup systems. The experiment succeeded, but it was never repeated. The Twin Towers used half the steel of normal skyscrapers because they were never supposed to be normal skyscrapers. They were the world's largest engineering experiment, conducted in real time with real money, affecting real people. An experiment that proved you could rewrite the fundamental laws of construction if you had enough political power and were willing to ignore every expert who told you it was impossible. The Rockefellers didn't set out to build office buildings, they set out to prove a point that American engineering could achieve anything, that political will could overcome technical limitations, that the impossible was just a problem that hadn't been solved yet. They succeeded. But the cost of that success reveals something uncomfortable about innovation. Progress isn't clean. Revolutionary breakthroughs don't happen through careful consensus building and risk management. They happen when someone with unlimited resources decides to force the future into existence, regardless of who gets displaced in the process. Radio Row's 30,000 workers with a price of proving that steel tubes could replace steel skeletons. The Port Authority's billion dollar gamble was the cost of demonstrating that engineering orthodoxy was just tradition in disguise. Today's skyscrapers are marvels of engineering, but they're also marvels of caution. They use more steel than the Twin Towers, not less. They have more backup systems, more redundancy, more safety margins. We learn from the experiment, but we also learn to be afraid of experiments. We build safer buildings now, but do we build bolder buildings? The Twin Towers were built during a brief moment in history when massive technological leaps were considered not just possible, but inevitable. The same decade that put humans on the moon decided to revolutionize skyscraper construction. The same government agencies that funded the space program funded experimental architecture. That moment has passed. Today's mega projects are evolutionary, not revolutionary. They optimize existing technologies rather than inventing new ones. They're safer, more efficient, more economical, and less ambitious. The Twin Towers represent something we may have lost. The willingness to risk spectacular failure in pursuit of spectacular success. The confidence that engineering problems exist to be solved, not managed. The belief that the impossible is just the untested. The Twin Towers use half the steel of normal skyscrapers because their builders refused to accept that normal was the limit of what was possible. They proved that revolutionary design could work, even if it came at enormous cost. The Twin Towers failed as real estate investments but succeeded as proof of concept. They failed to revitalize Lower Manhattan immediately, but succeeded in changing how the world builds tall structures. They failed to meet market expectations, but succeeded in exceeding every engineering expectation. Maybe that's the point. Maybe the most important innovations aren't measured by immediate success, but by long-term impact. Maybe changing the world requires building things that seem impossible, impractical, and unnecessary, until suddenly they become the foundation for everything that follows. The Twin Towers were never meant to be normal buildings. They were meant to prove that normal wasn't good enough. They were meant to demonstrate that American engineering could achieve anything, solve any problem, overcome any limitation. In that sense, the experiment was a complete success. The Twin Towers used half the steel of normal skyscrapers because they weren't normal skyscrapers. They were the future built 30 years too early. Less safe on paper, but that's the price of rewriting the rules. They were the future built 30 years too early by people who refused to wait for the future to arrive on its own. And maybe that's exactly what the world needed. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like the video and would like to support the channel, please like and subscribe. That stuff really helps the channel out. And if you have a friend that you think would also like this video, please feel free to send it their way. If you have any video topics you'd like us to cover in the future, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.